Okay, how's it going? I'm still working on the uh, addition of forces to the ball. So actually, I've ad added forces to the ball um, previously. So here I've introduced the mass because the mass is the scaling between force and acceleration. And I've added um, some get methods and a um, add force method. Uh, later on, we might do something where we refactor this, where we um, sort of keep track of the forces and there are, each force is its own um, object that we work with separately, but I don't think that's going to happen now and it might not happen ever. But that's something we could use. Right now, I'm just going to use a function as the force. And in fact, I'm going to go through and I'm going to work on building that function in this in this. Um, video. And when I'm using that, I'm going to take these get functions, which have all of these different properties, position, velocity, mass, radius, area, and volume, and use those um, properties of the ball, because we're sending itself, which is the ball, to the force function, force on, uh, which is going to be called air resistance. So we're passing the function in here. But we're going to apply these to the ball and so we're going to be able to, we're going to need to be able to get this information from the ball. That's why I put these get methods in here. Um, so really, that's what I'm going to do. Again, I probably should show you where we are in case you're not ready. Um, so I put this uh, print method in here. It's it's still going, but um, so when the ball is actually in flight, the uh, print method keeps printing the. Um, keeps printing the velocity. So you see it's at minus 132 feet per second um, the whole way through. It doesn't slow down at all at this point. It j the velocity stays the same. When we add the air resistance in, obviously it's going to slow down, which is why this print statement is in there. And uh, I did notice something that's interesting. When I hit the ball, you see it switches to 132 feet per second. Again, that's, like I said in the last video, that's because we're modeling this um, hit, the hit, we're modeling the ball hitting the bat, or the bat hitting the ball as a deflection, all right? And that's just re changing the, um, reversing the sign of the velocity. That's all you need to do with that in one dimension. Fairly simple. Uh, we're going to change that later on, too. Right now, that, that's what we're going to keep going with. Uh, now what I want to do is I want to get in the air resistance so that this um, 132 feet per second changes. And um, that's really what I'm working on now. So I've already worked on the um, ball. I did everything that I need to, need to do with the pitcher, right? So we can keep on going. We go all the way down to the functions. So in the functions somewhere, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this under the, oh, I should probably do this over the draw field. Draw should probably be last. So I'm going to just go in and I'm going to write a function for the air resistance, right? So I need a function for air resistance. I'm going to call air resistance, right? And it's going to take a ball, all right? Or it's going to take a thing. It's going to take something. Um, and so when it calculates the air resistance, it's going to be, um, it's going to follow this sort of function 0 0.5 times some, some constant C and um, times the density of the air, uh, density, uh, times the square of the velocity. Now this is actually the square of the relative velocity between the wind and the uh, ball, right? But we're going to just assume everything's, we're going to assume that the wind is constant, right? If that's one of the reasons why I might want to do a class. So if I had a class for the air resistance rather than just, um, a, you know, a function, then I could update the wind speed, do all sorts of weird things with the wind speed, and throw it in here. In fact, I could do something with the wind speed directly into the air resistance as well. Uh, but I need to, uh, if, it, if it's going to change at all, or if it's something that would change between um, throws, I'd still need to do something with that air resistance because the ball doesn't know anything about the air speed, and the pitcher doesn't know anything about the air speed. So I'd need to have an object 
for my um, air resistance font force. And then I'd have to re redo everything in terms of classes just for that reason. But in fact, we don't have to worry about that. Um, so the magnitude of this resistance is the velocity squared. We multiply that by the velocity squared. That's its um, dependence. And its direction is going to be in the opposite direction of the velocity. So um, it's going to have uh, it's going to have a direction which is going to be the opposite of the velocity. So it's going to be uh, minus 1.0 times the x component of the velocity divided by the magnitude of the velocity. So that's um, the x component of the direction. And then we also have a vy we have to use later on. I don't want to come back to this when we refactor, so I'll just do it right now. Uh, the y component of the velocity, vel1, divided by uh, probably not. I'll just use v. Oh, well use velocity because that's what it is up there all right so that's um that's the that's the uh, way we calculate the direction and then um we return resistance times vx and resistance times vy that's what we're going to return now we need to figure out how to get those numbers, right? Because right now we don't have any of these numbers, right? Uh, C and the C and the density um, are two different things. So the density of the air in slugs per cubic foot, I believe, is 0 0.0023. So that that's fine. We don't need to worry about that. Now that C, um, which is just some constant, is actually this drag coefficient here. Right, so I told you I was going to look things up in that physics of baseball book that I, or in some thing I have. I have this physics of baseball book um, by Robert Adair. This is a very good, a very good book for the physics of baseball. It's a lot of fun to read. Um, I had it sitting in my office and so forth. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to somehow get this information from this plot that's from this book into this function. Um, and, I'm actually going to not worry about that too much. I'm going to pretend like our baseball is smooth, so I'm just going to use about 0.5 as the drag coefficient. Uh, as you can see, uh, depending on our our um, depending on our speed, our velocity in miles per hour, our drag coefficient uh, reduces; it changes. And in fact, it's changing most steeply. It's changing a whole lot, basically right and around the area where we we throw our baseball, which is sort of perfect, right? That's exactly where you want all the complications to be is right where your phenomena are. Um, so I could write another function to um, get some sort of approximation to this curve. Uh, and then I could vary the uh, speed of the baseball and I could worry about what happens with the wind because this is going to be, this V is again going to be difference between the wind speed or the wind velocity and the um, ball velocity. I could do all that sort of stuff. I could make all sorts of wonderful complications and it would be a lot of fun. It's just not going to happen in the next seven minutes. So um, I've got these two guys down and now I have to figure out where to get uh, this velocity from. Oh, I need one more thing. I need the area. I forgot the area. Okay, so I need the area of the baseball, the cross-sectional area, and the velocity of the baseball. So that's this thing here. And the area of the baseball is equal to um, thing dot get area. That's it. And the velocity, the, the velocity is actually equal to thing dot get velocity. And I probably should have used speed here because these are really speeds. These have these have no knowledge of anything as far as the uh, direction is concerned. So let's see what is the speed. The speed will be uh, by the Pythagorean theorem, the square root 
something to the 0 0.5. So it's the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So we have an x component and a y component that are coming through with that vel. So that's vel0 squared plus vel1 squared. Okay. I didn't have to change the name of the speed, by the way. I just did it. Um, so that seems pretty reasonable to me. Let's see. Do I have everything I need? I've got my numbers here. I've got the numbers that are coming from my function or my baseball from my object. Um, and everything looks good. And I'm going to run it just to see if there are any syntax errors. There aren't syntax errors. There aren't any errors at all right now because I haven't done anything to provide errors. So how am I going to how am I going to get my errors? Well, I'm going to go into my engine. And um, before I update my ball, I'm going to add a force. And that force is going to be my error resistance force. So I'm just giving it a pointer to that function. I'm telling it, go do something with that function, uh, error resistance function. And let's see where my logic errors occurred. All right, so it doesn't notice anything yet. I think it's not going to notice anything at all. So let's let's see what happens here. If I make it run, you see the um, you you see that I've lost a I'm at, I am actually losing my um, velocity. It's reducing here. Uh, it's a little less than I expected. So I'm not sure why that is. Um, but you know, it is just a calculation, and I don't really know how much it should it should reduce. It shouldn't reduce very much, like I said before. I mean, we're still going really fast when it gets there. Um, so I'm going to just go with that. I'm going to say that that's a reasonable thing. Now I'm going to do something here where I'm going to pretend. Let's say I'm. Let's just pretend that I'm throwing this through water or something like that, and change the density of what I'm throwing it through. Now, now this should slow down significantly and it looks like a Bugs Bunny cartoon where everything slows down really quickly and you still can't hit it or possibly because it's slowing down so quickly you can't hit it. Um, it's really really difficult. Ah, there we go. So and it keeps slowing down you see the for three two and it's slowing down a little more than exponentially but it's still slowing down and um quite quickly and I'm not sure if it'll even get back to the pitcher right so this is sort of slower than it should be um, slowing down um, you may remember that I had previously said that I wasn't going to worry about air resistance I only, I'm only doing that because we I need that linear force um, if I have the correct numbers in here for the air resistance again when I run it um, there is very little effect, right? It's on the order of a few percent. It's, it's not really big. Um, so it's a little less than I thought, maybe about 5%. I thought it was about 10%, but it's still uh, small, right? So I think um, I think that's pretty reasonable. I, th I think you get the idea there. Uh, I will go around and I'll tweak it like I tweak to the batter so the batter is actually... Um, so, you know, swinging a little bit faster so he matches what I found in this physics of baseball. Oops. Um, but I will go ahead and um, keep on working on this, and hopefully everything will look really, really nice soon enough. So, I mean, do look up this physics of baseball. It's a great book, and you can, you know, add in a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to do in this uh, simple program all by yourself, and you'll have a great old time doing it, right? Because, I mean, that's what we're doing here, we're having a good time. So, see you around.